Lesson 16. The reason why most people find it so difficult to make money is because they do not know what money really is. They perceive it as an effect only, something outside themselves which holds the equivalent of any specific wealth or advantage they may desire. In its terms are condensed the differing values of all things, therefore the obvious way to obtain possession of any particular thing is to acquire first the sum of money which represents its value. But while the relation between money and what it will do is very clear to everyone, that is after all a very superficial aspect of something deeply beyond money itself, of power. Money is actually coined power, a materialized force. It is the expression in substance of a strength which has its origin in the individual. To spend money means to trade the crystallized efforts of human beings for an object worth that amount of work. To earn money means to exert through your own inner qualities a measure of power which commands a corresponding recognition in the material world. To fail to accumulate money is to allow those qualities to lie idle and unused except to the extent of bare necessity. The individual, therefore, is like a mill across a river. The stream of universal life force is the source of its own energy and activity, the motivating power which makes him function. In proportion as he scoops that driving energy from the passing current, transmits it along the various rods and pistons of his nervous mechanism, and stamps it finally through his distinctive qualities into the raw stuff of the material or mental worlds, he will contribute to the pool of all wealth an added quota whose value must be returned to him in the impersonal form of money. Yet unless he does really make such a contribution first, no amount of ulterior scheming or activity will avail to bring him the cash reward he covets. This is why the majority of those who make the acquisition of money the main object of their lives usually fall far short of their aim, while others to whom money is of only secondary importance besides some other dominant interest often reap its richest rewards with no apparent effort in that direction at all. The former see only money, and are blind to the mint within themselves by whose operation they can obtain it, the latter are exclusively concerned with operating their mint without any perception of what it produces. Neither have quite enough vision to link the cause with the effect and discern the infallible natural law which through their business of living is transacted. That law, which governs all the exchanges whose sum makes up the existence of the individual, is variously known as the law of exchange, the law of supply and demand, or the law of compensation. It determines that whatever an individual gives to the world of constructive personal effort, no matter in what department of life, the world must return its value to him in the aspect of that wholly impersonal power called money. In other words, the individual stands midway between the vast undifferentiated tide of universal life energy and its manifestations as material wealth. He is the channel through which it passes from one condition into the other, and in the ratio that he contacts it and thrusts it into expression through his activities, its equivalent in cash is returned to him. Ignorance of the law of compensation, and consequent failure to make oneself an open channel for it, is responsible for the failure of most people to become rich in any degree commensurate with their desires. Such individuals make the mistake of concentrating their efforts upon the effect instead of contacting the inner cause of which that effect is only the reflection. They are, so to say, trying to argue with an image in a mirror, which has every appearance of being the real thing but is in fact simply an aspect of it. Only when the fundamental cause the power generated through the development of inequalities, is changed will the reflected aspect as money move and grow. The channel within the individual through which the law of compensation achieves expression is called the money consciousness of that individual. Its physical organ in a brain is a cluster of nerve fibers known as the financial center. The proper development of this center, and the resulting expansion of the money consciousness, is in effect like the opening of an inner door between power in its primary condition as universal life energy and the same power in its diverse material aspects as wealth. In the new surge of creative force flushing through this center once it is properly opened, old barriers are washed away and one is swept past restricting mental limitations into a true perception of his relation to money, the visible expression of power, and the invisible power transmuted through him into that expression. That is to say, one's vision is enlarged so that he no longer sees just money alone, but also sees the source from which it springs and realizes at last the one essential truth on which the ability to make money is conditioned. This truth is that money is most readily acquired, not by taking, as is generally believed, but by first giving. 
The individual must create wealth within himself and pour it into expression before he can obtain the equivalent of that. Wealth in money. The wider he opens the inner door of his nature and the richer the flood of power that he pours through his various qualities into constructive activities, the greater will be the cash return which measures its value. Every human being is able to give, no matter how destitute he may appear to be in the beginning. He is born fully equipped with all the necessary qualities into a limitless ocean of power in its purest form as universal life energy. All that is necessary is for him to admit that raw material, power, transmuted through his qualities into whatever kind of wealth his aptitude may suggest, and pour that wealth through his activities into the brimming bowl of all wealth. Its corresponding value is bound to spill back upon him in the impersonal form of money. But unless he is first willing to take the initiative and generate the actual wealth within that alone can command the response, he will strive and plead in vain for the financial recognition he is not qualified to receive. The activity of giving is what develops the capacity to give and to receive, because the greater the tide of wealth one pours into manifestation the greater must be the riches showered back upon him. Yet very often some people seem to give a great deal without receiving any money in exchange for it. Their apparent generosity goes unrewarded. But there is a vast difference between merely seeming to give and actually giving. The virtue of a gift lies not within the gift itself, but in the individual who makes it. The thing given is presumably only evidence of some imponderable shifting of the weights within the giver, some change by which a corresponding part of himself is diverted into the interest of the recipient. Only the one who gives knows in his heart whether his gift is an empty shell or something of real worth, whether the change really took place or whether his donation was merely a mask to hide one of the two chief negative influences which destroy its value, fear or pride. Fear, the first of these, is perhaps the most common. It imposes a sense of limitations or sacrifice, so that the individual gives reluctantly, as if from a sense of duty or at the compulsion of circumstances. A gift so made is not a gift, it is simply tribute yielded to your own weaknesses, a bribe to buy your temporary immunity from some tormenting voice within yourself. Its effect will be not only to bring you no return whatever in money, but to work distinctly to your disadvantage because if you pay tribute to a foe you naturally increase his strength in the same ratio that you diminish your own. If you cannot give from the fullness of your heart, freely and with joy, it is much better not to give at all. This is one of the difficult lessons that human beings have to learn, yet until it is learned the path of progress will remain a steep and rocky way. The impulse to keep one eye on the gift and one eye on the selfish advantage it will bring is a barrier that the law of compensation cannot hurdle, and it will vanish only when the individual has developed himself to the point where he is able to give from his heart instead of from his mind. Know what true giving is, be ready to give abundantly, spontaneously, and there will be no need to worry about the returns. You will receive in proportion, no more and no less, but the balance where the exchange is measured lies within yourself alone. Pride, the second of the reasons mentioned, is a less frequent but no less effective impediment to the operation of the law. It afflicts those who despise money as something too sordid to measure the value of the gifts they give to the world. Therefore when they give of their highest qualities, and the world in the natural course of events returns to them a money equivalent, they are offended and resent the implication that their genius can be reduced to mere material terms. Their extreme sensibility, which is simply a subtle form of pride, impels them to withdraw and hold their qualities aloof from their fellow beings lest it should be said of them that they are selling those qualities. They prefer to avoid entirely the stigma of commercialism. But this attitude is not correct. However much an individual may loathe the idea of trade, he cannot consistently live and stay clear of it. Life itself is the activity of exchange between the individual and the world of which he is, a part. Money is a medium through which that exchange is made more easy, but there is no logical reason why resentment should be focused upon it any more than upon life itself. Therefore to despise money is pure conceit and succeeds only in hurting the one who indulges it without in the least disturbing the rest of the world. The natural and normal function of every individual is to express, to give out that which he possesses within himself. In so doing he inevitably becomes a benefactor to humanity, but he has no right and in fact no power to prevent humanity from expressing and giving out in return. The law of compensation, which is one of the immutable laws operating constantly throughout all nature, works also through every human being. 
Each one is a channel, a specialized mechanism of qualities into which power floats at one end and out of which it is poured in another aspect at the other end. If fear closes the outlet so that the channel is choked, or if pride stops up the inlet through which the motivating energy is contacted, the result is the same, inertia, leading to limitations and ultimate poverty in every direction. Nobody has the right to give without being ready to receive, and nobody should expect to receive without being first willing to give. To violate these proportions is to transgress the law of compensation and incur the unavoidable consequences of that transgression. Those who obtain money by stealing or cheating do disturb those proportions, and although for a time their activities seem profitable they always suffer the penalty soon or late. Their prosperity is a specious show, because having snatched from the pool of all wealth values for which they have given no equivalent in constructive efforts, they have no appreciation of the real worth of the money they acquire. Instinctively they feel within themselves that they have no right to it, as they actually do not deserve it. Their enjoyment of what it brings them is superficial, and their hold on it is very uncertain. Easy come, easy go is their philosophy, the light froth of a genuine poverty within which no amount of money can relieve. Almost invariably such individuals fall at the last into a material poverty as deep and barren as the actual inner poverty which they have created for themselves. Also, because money represents all to them, though they never understood or rightly valued it, they feel their deprivation far more acutely than the poor man who never had it to lose. They have nothing else to depend on, because they have never developed the personal qualities which would make them self-reliant. Therefore to lose their money is to lose something more important to them than their lives. Outright thieves and cheats, however, are not the only ones who fail to understand money. They are extremists, perhaps, in whom the misconceptions more thinly spread throughout the rest of mankind come to a head. The fact that they prey largely on the avarice, the envy, the carelessness and other faults of law-abiding people is proof that the majority of their victims are not wholly without taint. These little flaws, so common in the righteous armor of everybody, have led to many a financial crash and stirred up clouds of argumentative dust beneath which humanity has gladly lost sight of its own ignorance of the real nature of money. This ignorance has bred the idea of money as an evil power, the root of all evil, the source of crime, tragedy and wrong. No error could be more complete. Gold, the emblem of all wealth and the standard international basis of exchange, cannot carry a curse with it. It is a fundamental power, and like all fundamental powers is wholly impersonal, devoid of prejudices and incapable of producing any evil of its own. The only source of evil is the human mind which uses money as an instrument. The same impulse which prompts an individual to kick a chair after he has stubbed his toe on it in the dark prompts him to unload upon money the blame for his own abuse of it. Neither the chair nor the money are able to protest their innocence, they are both equally impersonal and entirely indifferent to the right or wrong of mundane things, therefore it is only human, as errors are often very aptly characterized, to dump the burden of guilt where it can readily be borne with no inconvenience to the one responsible for it. That accumulated dross of human evil is the supposed curse carried by money. Money is neither evil nor good. It is simply there, a neutral power crammed with dynamic possibilities, ready to unleash its prisoned force in the service of any end to which the individual applies it. Like electricity, it is an impersonal aspect of universal life energy, spun out of the orinial power through the dynamo of the individual and held available for whatever use the individual may design for it. We do not call electricity an evil force, yet electricity is used with equal facility to light a church, heal a disease or execute a criminal. It carries messages across space without discrimination, the good as well as the bad, the helpful as well as the vicious and destructive. Similarly with money, it is a concentrated power that borrows good or evil only from the hand that wields it, but it cannot justly be made to bear the blame for those human weaknesses and follies of which it is so frequently the victim. Eventually money always seeks its own level, in spite of the artificial barriers erected by human society to restrain it. To make money is one thing, to keep it is another. When the capacity of an individual to employ constructively decreases, the amount he is able to command decreases accordingly. Misuse of money through applying it in a destructive and wasteful manner, as previously described, does decrease that capacity by closing up the channels in the individual. The result is that the volume of its flow shrinks to accommodate itself to the narrower channel, leaving the individual much worse off than he was before. On the other hand, 
those who are constantly enlarging their capacity to handle money properly get the benefit of what others lose. Unfortunately, very few human beings know how to use money properly, especially if it has come to them through no special effort or merit of their own. The cynical observation that it is three generations from shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves is founded in fact, not because the son of a rich man is necessarily less endowed with the natural ability to handle money, but because he has never been obliged to exert his own qualities in payment for it. Consequently his capacity to handle it is not developed, he is blind to its value because he cannot see its constructive uses through himself, and like a leaky faucet not worth the trouble to repair he lets it spurt in wasteful extravagance through every vent but the right one. Meanwhile justifying his folly with the selfish contention that the money he flings away is his own. But he is wrong. Nobody really owns money, although it sometimes seems to be a personal possession. Individuals are simply trustees appointed to look after its proper use and distribution. Their term of office commences with their first responsibility and expires with their last, and the trusts bestowed upon them are in proportion to the worth they prove. If they fulfill their duties intelligently and honestly, a greater power is placed at their disposal. If on the contrary they are vain and foolish, and fail to measure up to the demands of their position, they are doomed some day to see their authority drain away like an ebbing tide, leaving them stranded on the bleak shore of poverty. This applies not only to the spendthrift, but to his counterpart, the miser, as well. Since money comprehends all the wealth of the two worlds of mind and matter, it is the golden key at whose touch every door within those precincts flies quickly open. Therefore many of timid vision are dazzled by it and worship it as the supreme power on whose altar they are willing to sacrifice their dearest possessions, even their own souls. Such an attitude is utterly wrong. Money can never be the supreme power, because there is one door which it can never unlock, the door of love. The clean and perfect part of our triune nature, where our higher spiritual qualities are enthroned, is beyond its reach once and forever. Those who abandon their true allegiance and place money in its stead bow their heads to false gods and invite their own destruction, because they put in the place of mastery that which is meant to be a servant to them. The rightful place of money is the seat of honor at the foot of the throne, not the seat of authority on it. Money is a secondary power which will serve you as nothing else so long as you direct and guide it to the satisfaction of your needs or ambitions. But the moment you give the scepter into its hand, you submit your neck to a yoke of slavery that will grind you mercilessly into the dust, because you will have deprived your higher qualities of the control which they alone can exercise. Just as vermin breed in the dark, so will all negative emotions breed when you close the door of love through which your higher nature should pour its cleansing light. To despise money, or to envy it in others, will never bring it to yourself. Contempt and envy are simply different forms of hatred. Hatred repels and destroys. Therefore to hate anything is to build a wall of consuming fire between it and yourself. You cripple your own ability to obtain it, because it withers at your touch. So, if you want to have money, you must learn first how to appreciate it, how to love and value it, not as a god or master but as a faithful servant always obedient to your control. A proper development of money consciousness throughout all mankind would make utterly impossible the tremendous contrasts between wealth and poverty so prevalent today. The ideal of an equal distribution of riches, which some extremists surge should be imposed forcibly upon people wholly undeserving of it, would then emerge naturally because through a more even development of the money consciousness of everyone the discrepancies between their capacities to handle money would be wiped away. Reforms start from within, not from without. The only way to get two quarts of water at once into a one quart measure is to reform the measure first. To a degree that reform has already started. The standard of living, especially in America, exhibits a marked improvement over similar standards of a few years past. People enjoy better houses, better and more varied food, wear better clothes and travel more from place to place. Comfort and even beauty have become the rule instead of the exception, and life is much more full and complete for the majority than it used to be. Simultaneously with this growth upward into a larger and wider sphere, the class distinctions which once differentiated so sharply the wealthy and non-wealthy fade gradually away. 
the good things of this world are no longer regarded as the peculiar privileges pertaining to the fattest purse, but are now subjected to the bold and calculating scrutiny of people who are more inclined to make their desires regulate their purse rather than let their purse limit their desires. Such is the effect of the slowly expanding money consciousness of the mass of mankind, releasing them from the bondage which they had acquired the habit of tolerating for so long. For the most part this evolutionary process is an unconscious one. Clumsily, blindly, people are reaching out and claiming things to which they dimly feel they have a right. Because they are claiming it they are getting it, since they are unwittingly putting into operation the law of supply and demand. But to let go voluntarily the safe anchorage to which they have so consistently clung and venture forth on a tossing sea of chance, as it appears to be, is no easy task. Ignorance makes them pay an exorbitant price for their gains. But that disproportionate price is neither demanded nor required. The growth of money consciousness is promptly responsive to the two chief aids which it is within the scope of everyone to give, knowledge and power. Through a thorough understanding of the laws involved, the unfoldment can be intelligently directed into the channels appropriate for it, and all the confusing obstacles erected by uncertainty, timidity and apprehension can be avoided with no unnecessary expenditure of energy. Then, having thus simplified and made easy the process itself, that process can be hastened into abounding growth by feeding it the power that it needs. This power, the universal life energy to which everyone has full access, is the basic universal force from which every subordinate power, every separate aspect of the whole mental and material worlds, is derived. Money consciousness, like the rest, is merely a sort of offshoot or bud depending on it for sustenance. The more life energy you are able to direct into that bud, therefore, and the more raw material you give it to transmute through its constructive activities into the aspect called money, then the more you stimulate it to a growth that will enable it to handle that increased flow. Its development is full and sound, resulting from a natural adjustment to the greater stream of power floating to it for expression, and is not a forced enlargement through willpower, with nothing to sustain it. In order to turn the current of life force into this channel of your being it is necessary to follow the instructions given in lesson 8 on how to vibrate to abundance. Those instructions, followed perseveringly and supplemented by the simple rules here given you, will inevitably bring about satisfactory results. Remember, the key to power in any specific direction is the same as the key to all power in its unadulterated form of universal life energy. The four square, represented by the four aspects of universal life energy, is the standard to which each center in your mind and body must conform. When equilibrium is established in any organ or quality, that organ or quality then coincides with the harmonious force to which it is to give passage and becomes an unobstructed channel for it to flow through. Just as a chord struck on a lower octave will draw a richly sympathetic response from the higher scale, so the right combination struck in your inner development will open a clear contact with the lofty plane of universal power. But there can be no false note. Therefore in all your life, in whatever direction you may turn your energies, whether financial or otherwise, take the measure of your goal first through the lens of the four square and mold your activities to that. Let every deed and every gift come joyfully and from the heart. Actions driven by energy and joy, winged with intelligence and pointed with honesty, or accuracy, fly straight and strong to the mark. So when those actions spring from your financial center, be sure that your money consciousness is not a warped and twist-tacked instrument which will impart its faults to what passes through it. Establish equilibrium there, and in so doing you will unite it with power that knows no limit. It will begin to function properly and to grow and unfold constantly and without end. Thus eventually you will be able to obtain all the wealth you can ever wish to possess. Yet from the crest of that accumulated money power you will always have to keep guard against the dangers which threaten your supremacy, because, like ripe fruit, it is only too ready to fall into the sudden decay of unwise spending. You must remember that money is a living force and that having been brought to a climax it cannot be held there indefinitely without stagnating. If it is not kept healthy by a constructive and refreshing flow, it will most certainly dissipate itself in an unhealthy and destructive riot of self-consuming negative action. Movement forward is life, and life is the only assurance against the decay of death.
Consequently your task is to keep the money over which you have control in constant circulation, so that it does not pile up behind the dam of your neglect and turn your healthy money consciousness into a poisonous morass. You must regulate its outpour to its inflow. Moreover, that outpour will always reappear in corresponding effects in your life. Therefore it cannot be simply an indiscriminate waste, an impatient gesture to rid yourself of something superfluous with the sole object of relieving the pressure. It must receive intelligent and constructive direction, becoming the source of an ever new and increasing crop of constructive works. To spend money foolishly is to misuse a great power which automatically exacts its own revenge, bringing destruction upon the one who spends it as well as upon the one on whom it has been spent. Those who hoard money learn eventually an even more difficult lesson. A miser is the poorest of men, because being a slave to his love of money, he cannot let a penny go without the most excruciating mental anguish and suffering. He not only stops up his outlet as completely as he can, but he thereby cuts down his income which he prizes above life itself, until it is the merest trickle. At both ends, therefore, he unwittingly inflicts upon himself as much moral agony as possible, and between the two he lets the little stagnating pool of his unused wealth rot him into a pauper grave. The inevitable result of the misuse of money, whether in hoarding or in spending, is that sometime you will be bereft of the power which you did not know how to control and employ properly. In devious fashion it will find its way at length into worthier hands, leaving you only the realization of a poverty which is not a matter of money alone, but of something within which money cannot touch. You who have accumulated wealth, whose money consciousness is well developed and who read these lessons with a glow of conscious satisfaction at the realization of it, you have doubtless felt the chill shadow of this poverty more than once and in your secret soul dread its approach again. It is a poverty of the soul a hunger that no riches can appease and no diversions completely banish or dull, because it cannot be reached from without. You yearn somehow to give more, to burst invisible bonds and pour into abundant expression a part of yourself which you feel but do not know. The satisfaction of that hunger also does not lie outside. It rests within, ready and waiting only to be found. Most people who are rich do not take the trouble to search for it but rely on the advice of others to provide a proper outlet for what they vaguely define as the best of themselves. Yet no eye but their own can ever penetrate to the corner where the best has its abode. Do not make the mistake of thinking that you can buy that best with money. It is not on the bargain counter. Money reaches outward with a long arm, but it cannot probe within where your most precious treasure is. That must be sought out by yourself alone but when discovered it will bring to you a wealth of contentment and joy that is beyond the measure of the wealth you know. Use your imagination when it comes to dispensing the money entrusted to your care. Charity as practiced today is the excuse of laziness, an insult and an injury generally to the recipient of it and a very real harm to the one who gives in that way. On both sides the effort which should stamp its worth is lacking, the weak are made more weak and the strong acquire a flaw which is an open avenue to moral dry rot. Real charity consists, not in helping others to that which they do not earn, but in helping them to help themselves. The little personal care and effort which enables them to knit into their characters just so much added strength and self-reliance, which props open a bit wider the inner door through which they live, is a far greater and more permanent contribution than the arms flung heedlessly through the narrowing crack. Happiness, the goal of rich and poor alike, is not an attribute of cash. It is the reward of endeavor only, and it must be earned. Very often rich people are notoriously dull. Wealth seems to have drugged their imagination, while those whose wits are sparkingly clear seldom have the money with which to realize their desires. Both are in a wrong condition, because each lacks the complementary power which would render useful the power that he has. Fortunately such a condition can be adjusted if the individual will simply take stock of his fault and proceed sensibly to correct it. A sluggish imagination can be nourished and developed without losing money, and money consciousness can be perfected without any sacrifice of the keen mind which can make it most useful. Both can achieve completeness by rounding out that side of their respective natures which has been neglected, and can thereby establish that equilibrium which is the basis of the greatest efficiency. One other responsibility of tremendous import devolves upon the wealthy, the transmission to their children of the ability to handle the fortune left to them. You must teach them the real value of money, not only as you learned it yourself through the vivid experience of making it, but also from the higher point of view as explained in these lessons. 
They do not actually start at the bottom as you did, the circumstances and environment into which they are born and with which they have to deal are entirely different, yet the intrinsic qualities on which they must depend to conquer that environment are the same. You prepare the environment for them, you must in all fairness prepare them to meet it. They will start from the money you made as from a foundation from which to build higher. Therefore they must learn how to make money, but in a manner adapted to the altered conditions rather than by doing your work all over again. So do not judge by the standard of your own life, and do not expect your children to know by instinct the things that were pounded into you by hard knocks. The little popgun of an opportunity with which you started your career is scarcely comparable to the high-powered financial rifle which you place in their inexperienced hands. Guard against casualties by teaching them its use with the same intelligence and skill that you employed in making it, and you need not worry about them becoming a credit to your name. They will. Finally, avoid the mistake of thinking that schools and educational institutions can perform this task for you. College can at best only partially develop your children and equip them with something to use if they know how, but can never produce that complete and rounded development of body, mind and soul which will enable the individual to fulfill the higher and more difficult duties imposed upon him by the money entrusted to his care. That is something that money cannot buy. You alone can properly explain what wealth actually is, where its value lies, how it is acquired, and how it is to be spent. You know, because you have built it into the very stuff of your nature and character. That is the really valuable heritage in your power to leave, and the crowning success of your life is the success with which you impart it to the new generation springing up from you. Give them, not the evidence of what you have been able to do but the intrinsic strength by which you have been able to do it, and you will provide a legacy that will outlast and ensure all the others. Exercises Morning and evening continue to practice the star exercise, relaxation, silence, constant contact with universal life energy, and concentration. Then, as the new exercise for this week on whose performance these others will be focused, proceed as follows to the process known as materialization. After you have entered into silence and made the contact with universal life energy, concentrate your thought on money. By so doing you will direct the flow of life force to the financial center in your brain through which your money consciousness finds expression. You will start it out of its lethargy, stimulate and strengthen it in its growth and exert through it an ever more powerful and far-reaching attraction for the object of your concentrated thought, money. In this procedure be clearly conscious of what money really is. Know that it is a world power flowing to you and through you continually. Let your realization of its true nature dictate your perception of it. Feel your oneness with it, your identity with the limitless supply of abundance and wealth. Do not pray or beg for money, or indulge a subservient attitude toward it. Experience rather the joy and certainty of possession, the sense of your right to it as one of the inherent powers to which you are born. Recognize and develop your capacity to control it, and be confidently ready to receive it in proportion. Let no fear or doubt enter your mind in connection with what you are doing. The invariable effect of fear in any of its aspects is to paralyze and close up, and its influence on your money consciousness will be to contract its organ, the financial center, and pinch off the vitalizing current of life energy. As you have nothing to lose and everything to gain, there is no excuse for fear. Simply know that the thing you want you already have. Be securely conscious of it, and it will be so. Practice this new exercise until results show that the desired unfoldment has started. Then continue to practice it diligently in order to promote that growth with ever greater vigor. Your money consciousness will so develop that realization will always more promptly and more richly crown your endeavors, because you will have trained yourself to a greater capacity for handling and attracting money. In the end, as you render yourself a wider channel for its flow, you will overcome all the limitations which vex and restrain your ambitions, and will emerge into an untrammeled prosperity. Do not hasten or try to force conditions by forcing issues. Willpower is not a friend to permanent achievements. The best and only lasting growth is the natural one. Impatience is a barrier to any force of nature, so when universal life energy is used one must dispense with it if the laws of nature are to take their course. Patience and perseverance are the two qualities which ensure solid, ordered improvement, and by exercising them you are bound to win. Questions and Answers to Lesson 16 1. What is money? Money is, actually coined power, 
the expression in substance of a strength which has its origin in the individual. 2. How can it be acquired? It can be acquired, by pouring into constructive expression through one's inner qualities a corresponding amount of power in its pure state as universal life energy. 3. What is the law of compensation? The law of compensation is, the law which governs all exchanges whose sum makes up the life of the individual, and which determines that whatever the individual gives out to the world must return its value to him in the impersonal form of money. 4. Through what channel in the individual does it operate? The channel in the individual through which it operates is, the money consciousness of the individual, represented in the brain by its physical organ called the financial center. 5. On what initial activity is the ability to make money conditioned? The initial activity on which is conditioned the ability to make money is, the activity of giving. 6. What two negative influences are mainly responsible for neutralizing this activity, and how do they act upon it? The two negative influences mainly responsible for neutralizing this activity are, 1. Fear, which paralyzes the financial center and consciousness. 2. Pride, which deludes the individual into deliberately closing himself against the operation of the law of compensation. 7. Define true giving. True giving is, a spontaneous and joyous expression from the heart, born of a superabundance of wealth within and entirely above any sense of duty or any expectation of recompense. 8. What fundamental cause of poverty can be avoided by conforming to the law of compensation? A fundamental cause of poverty which can be avoided by conforming to the law of compensation is, inertia, which leads to limitations in every direction. 9. Explain the evil power of money. The evil power of money, exists only in the human mind, which is the single source of all evil and has laid the blame for its own misuse of money, a wholly impersonal power, on that money itself. 10. How should money be regarded by the individual? Money should be regarded by the individual, as an honored and respected servant, always obedient and effective in that capacity, but utterly destructive when uncontrolled. 11. What is the crowning heritage that a rich man should impart to his children? The crowning heritage that a rich man should impart to his children is, the ability to handle properly the money entrusted to their care. 12. What fundamental power determines the scope of all the activities described in this lesson? The fundamental power which determines the scope of all the activities described in this lesson is, universal life energy.